in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I come before thee in the reading of the book of Revelation, chapter 6. Allow me to do the following reading as we go into an especial prophetical message for this hour, for this time, for you, for the church, and for the whole world. This is a very crucial prophetical message in chapter 6 of the book of Revelation. As we go reading, I would like to make possible for you to remember that the book of Revelation is singular, is special, is unique in the entire Bible. It's so special that in chapter 1 of the same book, we read the following, verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. That is the special meaning that the book has, not only in the sense of prophecy, but in the sense of your personal blessings from the Lord, in the sense of your personal behavior as a Christian, in the sense of your personal needs, as a child of God. Allow me to read chapter 6 of the book of Revelation as we go into the prophecy of the four horsemen. And I saw when the lamp opening one of the seals, and I hear as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse and he that sat on him hath a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. As we read the first seals of the seven seals that the Lord Jesus Christ opened, and I want to make this a special emphasis. When he opened this first seal of the book that was given to him, we understand by chapter 5 of the book of Revelation and that very prophetical introduction that this is not the Antichrist, the horseman of the white horse. The horseman of the white horse is very clear, not only, but very biblical and very prophetical. There is the image, the figure, the person of the Antichrist himself, not Christ. That must be told right from the beginning. Throughout the years, the Jesuit order has tempted and tempered with this revelation, bringing false interpretations, even not only to millions of Roman Catholics, but millions of Protestants, Christians, and Pentecostals as well. That false interpretation was based upon orders of the Jesuit general, Ignatius of Loyola, when he commissioned himself three special Jesuits by the name Rivera, Alcázar, and Lacunza to do exactly not only this perversion of the gospel, but to bring about tremendous historical distortions, even historical distortions throughout the history of this planet. Throughout the history of the church, throughout the history of the Roman Catholic institution, Catholic has been betrayed by their own Catholic leaders. Catholics have still been betrayed this prophecy will open wide open the minds and the hearts of those who want to believe Jesus Christ. For that very reason, we begin in this general introduction by saying that another emphasis in these prophecies of the four horsemen is the expressions written and inspired of the Holy Spirit, come and see come and see. He doesn't say, come and hear, come and read. He said, come and see. It's time for the church not only to read the Bible, but it's time for the body of Christ. It's time for Christians all over this planet, all over this world. It's time more than to read the Bible, more than to hear about the Bible. It's time for every Christian to see what the Bible is all about. 
the fulfillment of prophecies are before our very eyes. No longer we are reading the Bible and waiting for prophecies to fulfill. Now we are reading the Bible and seeing prophecies being fulfilled. Among other prophecies are the prophecies of the four horsemen being fulfilled before our very eyes. No longer we have to wait as many centuries back of, to the point of seeing or understanding, understanding the prophecies being revealed in this chapter 6 of the book of Revelation. Today we can read, we can hear, and we can see. Come and see is not only the emphasis, but in verse 2 of chapter 6 of the book of Revelation, even John, the instrument of this revelation under the Holy Spirit and the angel that brought these prophecies about, listen, what, what his own impression, not only, but his own feelings about that expression, come and see. He said in verse 2, and I saw, he will not respond as I read or I hear, but he said, and I saw. What that means is this prophetical book, among other specialties, have the specialty that was given as a privilege, I will say, or more than a privilege, is a divine will to John not only, but to the church, for us to see what we read in this Bible. Today, we have the best times in history to see what we read, especially speaking about the papacy, the popes of Rome. Do we see the papacy today? As a matter of fact, today is more relevant to see a pope than never before in history. Popes are not being seen, especially the present pope, John Paul II, is not only being seen on television throughout the world, like uh, in these last masses of Christmas and the Holy Week. But now the popes are being seen in every country, especially this pope. He is being seen all over every country. As I'm speaking to you, the pope do not cease to travel. He is making plans right now, right at this moment. He's making plans for other countries to be seen. That means that we are given more opportunity in the whole history, in 2,000 years of revelation of God's divine word, we have been given. We, Christians today, are being given the best part of them all. Not even the apostles, not even John, was so close to see what you are able to see and what God has granted us to see during this time, that even in the time of the apostles. They hear many things. And they were so desperate to see it that they believed that Jesus Christ was about to come in their own time. That impression was given on the, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Immediately we see now that this pope not only is being seen by multitudes in country through television, here by radio, but now he personally come to visit every country. At this point, I will say, more than three core parts of the world, this pope has already visited. That means that we are getting close to see the fulfillment of these prophecies and their climax. Fulfillment of this process has been taking place for centuries. I will say more than 1,600 years already. This very first prophecy of the first horseman that sit upon the white horse already begin in the time of Constantine the emperor. Was precisely under the fulfillment of the process in 2 Thessalonians. Let me call your attention and your Bible to 2 Thessalonians how this prophecy came about to be fulfilled already before the book of Revelation was to reveal the details of the prophecy, Paul, as speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, already gave to the church the signal of this prophecy, the signal of this prophecy. Read with me in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, listen to this. 
verse 6. And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. Who is to be revealed? Verse 4 said, Who opposed and exalted himself about all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, in verse 7, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. He doesn't say the mystery of iniquity will be at work in the future. He said already in the first century, already the mystery of iniquity doth already work. That mystery of iniquity that will put in manifestation that very man. Not the mystery, the man of the mystery of iniquity. Now, there is two different things here. One is the man of iniquity and the other is the mystery of iniquity. Now, the mystery is what was already at work but not a man. Only he who now let it will let, until he be taken out of the way. And of course, the Jesuits themselves that has been taking good care of telling you who is that that was to be taken away or will be taken away in the future for, for some others that has brought future interpretation of this prophecy concerning who is to be taken out of the way. Who? In order that the mystery of iniquity manifest that man of iniquity. Who is to be taken out of the way? In the year 337, 337, an emperor died, Constantine the emperor, fulfilling all the work of infiltration, penetration, perversion of the gospel into the church of Christ. Of course, he was not able to take possession, as some historians say, of the Church of Christ. He was not able to penetrate the Church with all the, his idolatry and paganism that he died with. Because some people said he died as a Christian not only, but he was converted. Many historians agree that he was converted to Christ and his gospel once he had a vision. And which vision? He hears Jesus Christ himself in Latin, in the language of Latin. A language that never was spoken of Christ, I can assert to that. The Bible has that authority for me to stand on it. Second, a language that was always the language of a pagan empire, not only, but the language that was used by the occult and is still being used. As a matter of fact, it's the language preferred by all the people involved in occult, regardless of what color of the occult you belong. Whatever color of the occult you belong, whether it's spiritism, satanism, whether it's santeria, whether it's voodoo, whether it's any, any phase of the occult, you use Latin for your experiences as part of your religion. It's not true. Latin, beside this, is a language that never was intended to be used by the Holy Spirit. Not only Christ never spoken, but never was intended to use by the Holy Spirit. The first time that we hear about Latin in the Gospel is when already the decree was given by the rulers of Rome to place upon the cross of Jesus Christ a sign saying, that he make himself the son of God. He proclaimed himself as a king. And that was written in Latin, in Greek, and Hebrew. Of these three languages happened that Latin was not chosen of the Holy Spirit to inspire the New Testament. Was chosen Greek. A language that was already dead. A language that was already declining, a, a language that was not in use already, except on the forbidden laws by the Roman Empire was being used in secret. Even the books of the Greek philosophers was under empire emperor's decree to be translated from Greek into Latin. Greek philosophy. What happened? What happened is that the decree from the Roman Empire 
do not allow, not even Jews, to speak their own language, Hebrew. In order for a Jews, even in their own land, to have any communication, to obtain any food, to gain work or gain favors of, of the Roman authorities, they must speak Latin. In midst of all this, Latin was the only official language of the Roman Empire imposed on every other nation, imposed on every other society in those very days. You could say the Latin was the best vehicle to transport and communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. The quicker, the sooner, the better. There was a language that can communicate with every other person almost around the world in very few days. Nevertheless, even the Holy Spirit rejected. Under the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the day of Pentecost, the Jewish feast of Pentecost, once the promise of the prophet Joel was fulfilled, under the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, every other apostle has spoke in every tongue around the nations, around the world. The most regional languages were spoken by gift of the Holy Spirit, but not Latin. Amazing. That, as a matter of fact, was taken as a signal of rebellion. Can you imagine the apostle being placed in jeopardy because obedience to the Holy Spirit. Yes, they were in jeopardy. They were speaking every other language that was being forbidden by the Roman authority through the gift of the Holy Spirit, but not Latin. As a matter of fact, it was no need for the gospel to be preached in the day of Pentecost by speaking in tongues, because if he, the apostles uh, spoke and preached the gospel in Latin, most of 90% of the people there, they will understood in Latin, but they never preach in Latin. What is happening with Latin? Latin not only have become as uh, the language of the Antichrist, but it became the vehicle of the prophecy mystery. As a matter of fact, the titles of the Pope along with the name of the Vatican, they all fit within prophecy, coming from Latin and translating on their prophecy. You will find many surprising things. For instance, the name Vaticanus comes from their Latin root, Vaticanus. This is the Latin root for what is called the Vatican. Vatican is a transliteration from the Latin root Vaticanus. Meaning what? Meaning center of a divination. How do you like that? The name Vatican means center of a divination. Yes, center of a spiritus. What that means, people working through a spirits. Divination. People working through powers of darkness. And that definition from the Latin rules come on their prophecy in chapter 18 of the book of Revelation, if you care to read. When already the angel described the Roman Catholic institution in three stages. Among others, read with me chapter 18 of the book of Revelation. He described the following. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils. What a description of such a religious system, more so a political system under the cover of religion. And the whole of every fallen spirit and the case of every unclean and hateful bird, the definition of the name of the city, Vatican, means that in prophecy. From the meaning through the interpretation of the language Latin and the use of Latin, we see that Constantine already failed, failed to show by 
the frame of divine revelation, within the frame of divine revelation, that Jesus Christ could speak to him, the emperor, in Latin. Because if I show you something, you will agree, not just with me, but you will agree about me, you will agree with the written revelation of God. Come to me, uh, with me, and follow the reading in chapter 26 of the book of Acts. 26 of the book of Acts. And reading in chapter 26 of the book of Acts, we have a surprising revelation. Listen to this. In chapter 26 of the book of Revelation, verse 14. Chapter 26, verse 14 of the book of Acts, pardon me. And when we were all falling to the earth, I hear a voice as speaking unto me and saying in the Latin tongue, Latin? You say, no, he's not reading well. Yes, exactly, I'm not reading well. I'm reading according to Catholic tradition. Because if he, this frame of divine revelation show us as a base for our understanding of God's divine revelation. Listen to this. Show us that Jesus Christ himself to an apostle as Paul, Saul of Tarsus. He did not have spoken Latin. And Saul knew Latin. As a matter of fact, he was a Roman citizen. You see, he knew Latin. Otherwise, he could not become a Roman citizen. He learned philosophy. He was a great a student of philosophy, he must knew Latin very well. But Jesus will not speak to Saul in Latin, in the language of the empire. He will not do it. The Holy Spirit said he spoke in Hebrew tongue, another language forbidden by the Roman Empire to be spoken. The same language of the people of Israel forbidden on the decrees of an emperor, now is spoken by Jesus Christ, the Messiah of Israel, the Lord and Savior of his church and his people. Do you follow what this prophecy is trying to bring to you, to the church and to the world? Listen to this. The separation between the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of the Antichrist make us clear there is never been a concordat between both. It never was a concordat between Satan and Christ. It never will be a concordat between the Church of God and the Church of Satan. It will never be a concordat between the Kingdom of God and the Kingdom of the Devil. The Kingdom of Darkness. Listen to this. And say in Hebrew tongue, soul, soul, why persecute Thou me, me, a personal noun, me. He doesn't say why thou persecute the church, why thou persecute Stephen, why you persecute Mary, Elizabeth. That were the real, truly Christians, that in flesh and blood they were being persecuted, including by Saul. There was a Stephen, among many others. But he will not say that. Christ will not say why you persecute my people. He'll say why thou persecute me. And the flesh of those Christians, and the flesh of those fathers and mothers and children, and the flesh of these very people that were born again persons, Christ was being persecuted. Now, if he Christ himself demand this from Paul, from Saul, listen to this, how much more he will not claim this from an emperor, an emperor that have not only all the power, all the authority to persecute the church of Jesus Christ during so many persecutions and killing and murdering so many Christians, throwing them to the lions and the arena. How Christ will just tell Constantine, hello, how are you? You shall conquer with this symbol. And Constantine said, and his story keep repeating throughout the years, and even many Protestants and even Pentecostals still believe in such a far, such a deceit, 
saying that he was told, Christ told him, the Emperor Constantine, with this symbol, you shall conquer. And he used the word conquer. And the symbol was a cross. There was not even the cross, contemporary cross that has been used in Roman Catholic liturgy all the time. Two lines, one horizontal and another vertical, two lines. That is the form of a cross that traditionally speaking, Roman Catholicism has brought to us as originated in Christianity. Crosses never has been originated in Christianity. All the crosses, regardless of the form of the cross, all has been originated in paganism, beginning with Egypt, Babylon, Egypt, and then the Roman Empire. The one, the make of the crosses, a very elegant, dramatic demonstration of more crosses than ever has been known or seen in the history of civilization. Crosses never originate with Christ. Crosses never originate with the apostles. Crosses never originate with the Church of Christ. They all were brought from paganism. As they use these crosses, then Constantine will say that in the vision that he had, he saw a cross, and he hear a voice in Latin. Now, not in the three characteristics of Constantine, in the three characteristics of Saul. Notice, listen to this. First, he said that he saw the cross. Now, Saul do not see cross. Saul in his vision, he was not able even to see. I mean, he was blind. Blinded by the glory, not of the cross. There is no glory in crosses. There is glory in the person of Jesus Christ. All the glory of heaven surround no the cross, surround the person. Paul, as a soul of Tarsus, was blinded by the presence of his glory. And he was thrown down from the horse down to the floor. Blind, blind by the presence of Christ himself and his glory and majesty. Amazing. The Constantine will not agree with that. If that was an emperor, he could see more than so. But not only that, he hear Christ as speaking in Latin. Now you can tell me that the Roman emperor do not know Hebrew. But you see, he's impressed to know this, that not knowing precisely he as an emperor Hebrew, he could have the evidence that Jesus Christ has spoken Hebrew and translation took place by the power of Christ himself. You follow me? It's Jesus Christ who has all the power, not an emperor. That could show more power than just plainly speaking in Latin. When he, through the gift of the Holy Spirit, could do exactly what he did as promise of his father through the prophecy of Joel in the day of Pentecost. I already brought to your attention that fact, historically, biblically, and prophetically. That is the framework of divine revelation. And finally, he said that not only spoke, but he claimed, he asked, he demanded to Saul why, why he was persecuting him. That was a lot. Beloved, if he demanded this for one single man that was not in power, that only was given power to do so, under even the emperors of Rome, how in the world you are going to believe that Christ will not demand that from an emperor that already had decree for that reason of persecuting Christians all over the world? How come? Finally, let me explain why we have given you this background and the prophecy of Revelation chapter 6, beginning with the papacy. There is a Latin title for the Pope, and as we come closer to know, to know what is the function and the role of that language with the person of the white horse, the rider of the white horse. 
what have to do? Not only the person, but even the color of the horse. The color of the horse. Why not black? Why not red? Why not yellow? Why the first horse and which the rider was sitting upon, why have to be white? Because even the color identified the message and the office. The Pope of these days wear white wherever he go. As a matter of fact, he will not leave his white dress regardless where he go. He always is in white. Identifying precisely that writhing. A horse is an animal that is not pure animal. In the list of the Old Testament, a horse is registered as an abomination, is one of the animals that are cursed, not blessed. Nevertheless, here, what that rider is bringing, blessing or curses, as he rides, as he ride around the world, what he bringing to the nations and peoples of the earth? He brought courses to Mexico when he was in Mexico. He brought courses to United States when he was in United States. He brought courses into Canada. As a matter of fact, if you want to know the detail, all what you have to do is to pick up the newspapers, just newspapers in your library, in your local library, of every visit of the Pope to every country. You will see what follow in this country beginning with the United States of America, that is the one that should you be concerned about as a North American, as a Christian. Listen to this. Even as a non-Christian, you are to be concerned that this United States of America, already the economy of this country that was blessed before the first pope visited this country, is in trouble until this very moment, beginning with the visit of the first pope. Ask your economist, tell, ask them why they will not write books about that, that coincidence. Some people say coincidence. It's more than coincidence, it's prophecy. Why the economy of this country will collapse, will begin to collapse from the first visit of the first pope to the United States of America. Second, why the political stage of this country is becoming more corrupted, no better. It's not improving. The cor political corruption is in the increase every 24 hours around the clock, from the presidents down to every even mayor of the smaller cities in this country. Things that you don't see before the visit of the first pope. I challenge you with facts, not illusions. What is the mystery behind the rider of the white horse is impressive to know. There is not a mystery in the future. It's a mystery that has been already revealed. The rider of the white horse is no other than the Pope of Rome. Let's put it in, in, in projection of the prophecy. Generally speaking, it's a dynasty of Popes. And every person, every single Pope, become a member of that dynasty until the last pope become the flesh and blood in which the spirit of the Antichrist, the now work in every pope, beginning with Constantine the emperor, will be manifested in that flesh and that blood as the Antichrist. No longer as an Antichrist, as the Antichrist. Let's see the characteristics of this rider, and let's see the characteristics that the papacy has brought through all history. Chapter 6 of the book of Revelation said that not only was riding on a white horse, but he had something. What he had? He had two things. He had a bow and a crown. Two things. Different from the rider of the white horse in chapter 19 of the book of Revelation, contrary to that revelation, that nevertheless uh, we can say already that was Christ himself. That was not the Antichrist in chapter 19. Here in chapter 6 is the Antichrist, the one that rides this white horse. Well, we see Christ riding the white horse in chapter 19 of the book of Revelation. Now, you see the distinctions are many. Among others, that Rider, there was Christ in chapter 19 of the book of Revelation, 
on a white horse, many more on white horses will follow. But to the rider of this white horse, and to this white horse, and fulfilling these commissions given by God as judgment upon this planet, upon this earth, against those who rebel against the gospel of Jesus Christ, these horses, the fellow that white horse, they were not white. Listen, they were different colors. That was precisely so different that we have for uh, at the second horse that followed the white horse was red. Red, not white. The third horse was black, not white. And the fourth horse that followed the white horse along with the other horses, red and black, was yellow. Now, among these distinctions, there is what he had. He had a bow. Listen to this, verse 2, chapter 6 of the book of Revelation. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him have a bow, a property. It doesn't say there was given a bow to him. No, he have already. It means something personal. It's so personal that today, John Paul II, more than any pope in the history of the dynasty of the popes, throughout the entire history of the papacy, no other pope in history became more relevant, not only in his person, but never before no pope has made more relevant a special symbol that is a prophetical symbol. I will say it is a fulfillment of prophecy. Listen to this. What is? See, watch well your TV set as you watch now and see and take a good look to this crucifix. Take a good look to this very crucifix that you are watching right now and your TV set. Listen to this. Don't look this crucifix very personal to that particular Pope, John Paul II. It, it is very personal. Not only in the way that he holds it, not only in the way that he uses it, but in the fashion of the use of that crucifix. From masses to public places, the Pope cannot leave his crucifix. As a matter of fact, he has a personal assistant next to him. His personal assistant, there is, cannot be any priest, a special chosen priest for that office, carry the crucifix alone with him when the Pope cannot take it. Now, you believe that these things are happening by accident? Or there is more than accident? There is more than accident. There is contemporary history. There is no other than the fulfillment of this prophecy. You may not believe in prophecy, but you have history, and you cannot avoid it. It's before you, before your eyes. And that very history that you see and witness right now is prophecy being fulfilled. Let me give you some of the details that you may understand and believe. Here. Above was given in the book of Genesis. It's a signal of what? Now you will understand more what is the real definition of a bow once you understand that God, one after the flood was finished, put his bow in heavens. It was a very colorful bow that today even the occult use. Can you imagine? The occult. Shema Vat, most of all the occult, from Satanism, going to Buddha, going to Spiritism, they use the bow as symbol of their practices. The bow. Now, while Christianity is used in that same symbol, there is a great deal of confusion here. Because you, as a Christian, 
may believe that that was a symbol given by God, truly. It was given by God. Nevertheless, Satan is using it to cover up his intrigue and his deception. But above have another form, the form that used the aborigines of this land, not to go too far away. The very aborigines of the land, their real weapon was a bar with arrows. The history of this country is full of them. That is called a bar. What that means? That he have a bar, but he have no arrow. What that means? Means peace. When a, arrow, when a bar without arrows was taken by even a Roman emperor, that means that he came in peace. The idea of the world was the arrow, but a bow without arrow means there was in peaceful manner. How this Pope come to you personally has dramatically shown so much charisma about peace than no other Pope in the whole history of the world. That is what his talk is all about. He may not speak about Christ, he may not speak about the Gospels, in my father, he do not even carry a Bible with him, but he never forget his crucifix. <gasps> he may not even carry a New Testament, not even the Gospel of John in his own pocket, but he carry a crucifix, fulfilling prophecy. In chapter 24 of the Gospel of Matthew, the Lord Jesus already gave a warning to his apostle, to the church, and to you and to me today. Christians as well, non-Christian, are admonished by that prophecy of Christ. Listen to him, listen to Christ now, and that prophecy in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24. As I read to you, I want you to underline certain words, especially four, four words here in chapter 24 of the Gospel of Matthew and the prophetical message of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Here is what he answered as a reply to the question of his apostles. In verse 2, he said, in verse, in verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that not men deceive you. Deceive you about what? What men is trying to deceive you about? Today, even in the 20th century, for 2,000 years, Man has trying to deceive. Satan has trying to deceive about someone. More than about certain things, Satan tried to deceive you about one person. That is Christ. As a matter of fact, millions of Roman Catholics are being deceived by the papacy about Christ. First, by the Pope saying that he is Christ on earth, the vicar of Christ. That is what officially. The definition of vicar comes from a title in Latin given to every cardinal that is appointed to be pope. Once the conclave take place, the cardinals all come and portion their hands upon the head of that particular cardinal that is going to be the next pope. And they all will proclaim that man as to as vicarius fili dei. You know what that means? A transliteration from that title in Latin into English means you are the one that take the place of the Son of God. Now, you got to examine this title with all sorts of details. You are the, first, is not you are one. No, you are the one. Now, that is different, quite different, that being one. He said, the cardinal said to him, to that particular man, that man of iniquity, as the prophet put it, the man that took the office of Constantine of the emperor after he died. That fulfilled the prophecy of Thessalonians chapter 2. He was the one to be taken away. He was taken away. Constantine himself removed from Rome to Constantinople in Turkey. Why? Who told Constantine to do that? The only emperor that ever thought about moving his office, his seat, from Rome to another country. Why he would do such a thing? What was about to take place? God divines intervention. The sovereignty power of God made possible 
that move. Not even men will do it. Not logical, no reason. God's intervention in human history. Now, listen to this. As God interferes in human history, immediately prophecy begin to fulfill. That mystery of iniquity begins with the first pope after Constantine the emperor. Already there, in the Vatican, the center of a divination, the center of a spirits, the headquarters of demons and Satan on planet Earth, the Vatican, sitting upon seven mountains. Not in Iraq, not in Russia, not in Persia, not in Babylon, no, 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 in Rome, built upon seven mountains. There is no seven mountains, not even in Iraq. Not in the desert, not in every place that have even title for each mountain, a name for each mountain. In which mountains? The first is built St. Peter's Basilic, so-called Peter's Basilic. Second, the North American College, the second mountain. The Jesuit North American College, built by Pius IX, is a gift to the first government that he prepare to rule the United States of America. For which reason was a civil war in the United States in the times of Abraham Lincoln? You see, we have too many historical facts to believe accidents. I mean, too many are overwhelming. We see now that in this prophecy, the angel revealed that not only have a bow, as you saw now, dramatically, what the meaning of the bow is, and the authority that that inflict, a mystical authority, not only, but political authority. Why? Because it's the only person in the whole world, the Pope of Rome, that holds two offices and two powers, beside. What is? He is not only the religious leader of his people, of his nation, and the whole world, it's a universal nation, it's an international nation. Hundreds of millions of Roman Catholics, not only after they are ba exorcised and baptized, they become Roman Catholics, they become Roman citizens. The Vatican citizens, automatically, under canon law. It makes them under one different government. If you are an American, you might as well say there is a Roman Catholic, you are not American. You are a citizen of the Vatican, regardless of your birth in the United States. As a Roman Catholic, you have another flag, not only the American flag, you have the Vatican flag. Third, as a Roman Catholic, you not only have another government, another flag, but you have another country. Is not this land. I said, and I repeat, is not this land. And four, you have another constitution. <gasps> another constitution besides the United States Constitution or, or whatever is left from the first constitution, the Christian constitution in 1620. There is a different constitution today. You might as well know this. Whatever is left from the first Christian constitution that was made from the Old and the New Testament in this country, above all other countries, whatever is left, you are not even faithful to that constitution. The proof is what we have in the street about abortion today. It's not the people and monks and nuns are going to the street to stop abortion because they believe that is immoral and criminal. No, beyond that is something else. They have orders from the Vatican to do it. Above the laws of men, above the laws of men, the Vatican need more Roman Catholics. This is why mothers more have and bear more children. That is an order from the Vatican. Doctors are Roman Catholic. They will sacrifice whatever the Vatican tells them to sacrifice. They'll sacrifice the mother instead of the child. You see, that is on the order of the canon laws of the Vatican. That means that I have given you 
few of the many hundreds of historical contemporary examples of what your constitution is. As a Roman Catholic, is the canon law, not the constitution of the United States. This combination of power, the political and the religious power, bring us to the fulfillment of the prophet of Daniel the prophecy. They're already in the image, saw this as the empire that will bring about that combination. It will be a political power under the cover of religion. And that is what the papacy is all about. That is what this rider of the white horse is all about. Listen to Jesus Christ in verse 5. For many shall come in my name, say, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. First underline, many. In my name, second. Third, listen to this. Saying, I am Christ. Fourth, shall deceive many. Four characteristics of the papacy. First, every pope come in the name of Christ. Second, they all confess to be Christ on earth. Everyone, including John Paul II. He believed to be the vicar of Christ, the visible, physical head of Christ on earth. Not even a spiritual or mystical, physical head of Christ on earth. Third, will say that shall deceive many shall deceive many. What that means is that no other power in the world has deceived more people in the world than the Pope of Rome, and is still deceiving more than any other man. No evangelist, regardless of their errors, doctrinal errors, regardless of their millions of conversions of people, regardless of their failure, regardless of the perversion of the gospel, no political leader in the world, regardless of their greatness, could deceive more people than the Pope of Rome is deceiving at this very moment. Christ has given you not only an admonition and a warning, he's given you an invitation to come out of her. He said, come out of her, my people. Her. Listen to this. The wife of the bride of the rider of the white horse. It said also, as we conclude, it said that he was given a crown, the symbol of that authority, political power, not only, but the combination of both, mystical and political. He had not only a triple crown, an imitation of Christ, that have many crowns. But at the same time, he also went forth, conquered and to conquer. No pope in the history of the papacy has been more relevant to the entire world than John Paul II. He not only has been welcomed by Catholics, but has been welcomed even by anti-Catholics, even communists. Communist countries have fallen to his feet today. And not only that, Protestants, many Protestants, are welcome the Pope. As a matter of fact, even Pentecostals, and Baptists, and many more. No Pope has ever such impact in so many people as John Paul II has done. We need, with urgency, to yield to this prophetical invitation, to come out, I mean, to come out, make a difference today. As a Christian, begin to make that difference between Christ and the Antichrist, between Christ's church and the church of the Antichrist. Make that difference is needed for the evangelization of the Roman Catholic people, for the salvation of those who need Christ and salvation. May the Lord keep you and bless you. Father, as I come before thy throne of grace, I ask thee to bless those and every individual that has watched this message. It's time to watch, it's time to see. I ask thee to bless them, to forgive those who now believe the gospel of Christ for their own salvation, as they receive Christ the Lord and Savior by grace through faith. I ask thee to preserve them unto the Lord's coming. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.